What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to the Call Game Recap. It feels good to be here, man. Um, yesterday, I guess we resumed regular season play. I didn't watch a single second of basketball yesterday. I'm going to keep it a buck with you. Today, though, we sat in this chair. We watched all of that. Okay, not all of it, but a lot of basketball, and I'm here to talk about it. Even though I watched so much basketball today, the only thing that was in the back of my mind as I'm watching these teams play is the trade deadline. We're like 12 days away. I think it's the 23rd, so we're like 12 days away or so. And I'm just watching teams play. And I'm like, man, this team could use a defender. I know a guy on a losing team that could help. Like that's, I'm just putting on a GM cap for no reason. It's just like the most fun regular season part for me um, because I want to see how a good team can elevate itself to a great team, see a team that is should probably be selling. It's just all of those type of things. So that's like the, the scope I'm watching games at right now. And while we're on this topic, because I have not been able to talk about the Blake Griffin stuff on this channel, let's, let's hit on some of that now as we open up the show talking about the Brooklyn Nets. My opinion on super teams, God squads, whatever you want to call it, has dramatically changed over my time as an NBA fan. When the Miami Heatles were a thing, I absolutely hated it. I, I thought it was terrible for the league. And that changed once they lost that first championship. That changed when they lost that last championship. And you know what? I've had this conversation with people that disagree with me. And you know what? I've, I will never tell somebody that they're wrong here because I understand seeing the standpoint of, of when there is this super team for a casual fan, why the heck would they watch regular season games or even playoff games if there is this giant out there that we all know is probably going to win, right? I understand that. But as a, like, as a diehard NBA fan, I love to have something to like, I'm not saying I'm rooting against the Brooklyn Nets because I, I actually really like a lot of the players on their team, but it's like, I would love to see an underdog win and come in and beat the, you know, I love an underdog story as much as I love to see like Kevin Durant play well. You know what I'm saying? So with them bringing in Blake Griffin, I'm not one of those people that think, oh man, it's super unfair. Uh, have y'all been watching Blake Griffin for the last two seasons? Now, I understand, I'm not saying he's going to come into here and play the same way he played for Detroit the last two seasons. Like, And when he was in Detroit, they made a couple signings this offseason to get players at his position. They drafted a few players at his position over the last couple seasons. So I understand him just kind of going through the motions and maybe not playing as hard because why would he? He's on. He's the oldest player on a rebuilding team. But even all of that considered, he's not the all-NBA player he was three years ago. Let's, let's relax on that. If Blake Griffin could come into the Brooklyn Nets and be the fifth sixth best player on the team it's a w for the team and it's a w for him he's one of those players that his resume looks so much better with a ring on it so it, it made sense for me when i saw he was being bought out i immediately knew he's going to brooklyn because he needs that ring like he's a borderline hall of fame guy when he gets a ring depending on how much he contributes i mean obviously if he gets a ring at 40 where he's like the 15th man on the roster it don't matter but like if he gets a ring like this season where he's contributing like it helps him a lot. He's probably a Hall of Famer instead of being like a borderline guy. But I'm not one of the dudes that's out here like, man, the NBA is ruined. It is funny, though, that last year was like the first year in a long time of parity. You remember that parity? We had, instead of having big threes across the league, we had dynamic duos. Anthony Davis, LeBron, uh, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Ben Simmons, Joel and B. Uh, Chris Middleton and Jan. I don't know. But people, last year was supposed to be parity, and it, the season got canceled. And then now, it may not be the traditional word of parody, but I still believe that after all of these things, the Brooklyn Nets aren't invincible. They aren't. I mean, they, like when they make the James Harden trade, I think our biggest um, things that we talked about was like their defense, which low-key, they kind of getting it together. We don't expect them to be a top-10 defense, but if they could be an average defense, it's kind of scary. They're, they're starting to put that together a little bit. And their depth, and well, their depth is getting better every single game. Joe Harris couldn't hit the side of the backboard today, but Landry Shaman was there. Bruce Brown has been playing amazing. Nick Claxton is good for 10 good quality minutes a game, and now they add in, uh, in, in Blake Griffin. So uh, I'm excited to see what this team could do. They they just won another game. I think they're 10-1 without Kevin Durant. But again, I don't think they are invincible, which is beautiful for the league. Kyrie Irvin, every time I watch Kyrie Irvin, Kyrie Irvin, Damian Lillard, Steph Curry, just on the point guard list. These are guys that when I watch them, I'm so happy that I have the ability to watch them play basketball. They make everything look so effortless. Kyrie Irvin takes some of the most difficult finishing like layups of all time, and he makes it look so easy. I don't know why the Boston Celtics just allowed him to run to the basket every single play. But if you're going to let him get to the basket, he's going to finish it. You know what I'm saying? They had no resistance in the transition, and Kyrie is a king of transition ball. Um, so, yeah, it was a cool game. Good to see Marcus Smart back on the court. Um, Jalen Brown hasn't looked very good in the last five games or so when you exclude the All-Star game where he was dominating, it seemed like, because it it's the All-Star game. But, like, if you look at his game log or the feel of him the last five to six games, he hasn't been at that All-Star caliber level, and they still haven't had an opportunity to have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Kimball Walker all play well at the same time. So, um, shout out to Brooklyn. 
Shout out to Boston, I guess. Let's get to the second team. And, and this was I was trying to figure out which of these two teams is going to be the headliner of today's episode. Let's talk about the Phoenix Suns because I am so confused. They are amazing, right? They are amazing. They're one of the few teams in the league that is, like I think it's top seven offensively and defensively. We knew that adding Chris Paul to the team was going to make them a playoff team. Every NBA fan knew that. I don't think many of us predicted that this team was going to be as good as they are right now. And a lot of that is due to, to of course, the progression of some of their players. Devin Booker, um, especially compared to early in the season, has been playing better now. Um, Mikael Bridges has hit a step. But I, I want to focus... <laughs> I don't know if I've talked about Dario Sarge on his channel just yet, but man, do I love Dario Sarge right now. And you know what's so funny? He has, I don't want to say revolutionized his game, um, but he had always been a four. In those Philly days, he was a four, and they allowed him to play make a little bit. He got traded to Minnesota where they, they allowed him to be a four off the bench, and he did, he never got his footing in, in Minnesota, if you ask me, because I think they were trying to play him at the four off the bench, and he didn't just feel he didn't feel confident in that. And then now he gets to Phoenix, and they're allowing him to come off the bench, or they're, they're got that as his role, but he's playing the five. And when you look at Dario Sarge and think about his track record, you wouldn't think that Dario Sarge the five was a good idea because he's this flat-footed, kind of slow-footed guy, right, at the center position. How is he going to defend pick and rolls? Pretty damn good. Um, if you're actually watching them, they, they do this thing where, like, with the rotations, Devin Booker hits the bench early. Now it's Chris Paul and Dario Sarge against second units, and you might as well add 20 points to the team. The plus-minus of those two on the court together, ridiculous. And what I like about today's game specifically, they had a game plan, double Damian Lillard, and Dame still ended up with 30, which just shows how great of a player Damian Lillard really is. He only needed this much space, and he was getting shots off. But they were doubling Damian Lillard like anybody else can beat us. If they if they beat us in that way, we deserve to lose. But they they um they doubled Damian Lillard, and Mighty Williams wasn't afraid to tell DeAndre Aiden, "Nah, you good right now, bro. Dario is playing amazing." And I love when coaches do that. It it shouldn't matter the status you have on this team. If your backup is playing better tonight, play the backup. And and I know that's easy to say, but not every NBA team plays it like that. I mean, when you see a player have a four minute stint where they are amazing, and then now the starter comes in, you're like, "Bro, why?" Why not just let that guy play six more minutes Why, if he's playing this well? And Dario's that guy. Jay Crowder is just a winner. I've, I've mentioned this on the show before when we were talking about the Miami Heat during their struggles. We're like, Jay Crowder just does winning things. He's hitting all of his shots. McCarroll Bridges hit that step. And adding Frank Kaminsky to the starting lineup so far has been, I think they've only lost one or two games of Frank Kaminsky starting. He don't come out there and he's playing 40 minutes as a starter, but he he adds a different element where Jay Crowder come off the bench. I really like this team. And the fact that Cameron Payne is an NBA player is still so so, so very confusing to me. I saw this man play his early parts of his NBA career. He was my starting point guard for a little stretch. So I know how bad he was. But to see him actually play quality minutes, he had a possession. Anthony Simons bringing the ball up the court, calling plays. And Cameron Payne just picked his pocket and got an and one. It's like Cameron Payne wasn't doing that type of thing. Cameron Payne was doing dances with Russell Westbrook. He was, you know what I'm saying? He was a bench mob player. He barely played, and now he's playing quality, quality minutes on one of the more surprising teams in the NBA. I'm so I, I I'm still kind of trying to decide would I put them in that contender tier, or are they just a really, really, really good team? You know what I'm saying? Because not many teams get the contender tag. They're they're working on it though. I think I think they're definitely working on it. The, okay, let's talk about um rapid fire some of these other games. Tony Snell called game. I didn't watch a lot of this game. I keep it a buck with you, but I got the Tony Snell picture in the back. When anybody called game, we have to show show some love. Um, the Raptors were missing three starters. Norman Powell has been amazing. I'm watching this whole game by the way. Like I said earlier, and the only thing I can think about is Kyle Lowry and potential trades. It's been rumored for the past couple of days or weeks. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen. He can't, he had the comment it was like he's gonna retire a Raptor, but he didn't say that he's going to play until retirement for a Ra as a Raptor. And I think that this team could hit a new new era. You know what I'm saying? Let Cal Lowry go play for a real like contender contender. And let Norman Powell, Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam take you to the next, you know, next takes you to the next place. And then whatever you get back in and return for the trade. Um, but again, I didn't watch much of this game. Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler can continues to be the most clutch player in the NBA behind Terry Rose behind Terry Rozier. Just the way that this man could take over fourth quarter is insane. They played terrible through the first three quarters. They were going against the Magic, who was cool to see Aaron Gordon back on the court today. But the Magic, y'all know, they still have tons of injuries. They're not they're not there just yet. They struggled through the first three quarters. They couldn't hit the shots. Um, they weren't really taking care of the ball in a, in a traditional sense. But Jimmy Butler's like, okay, it's the fourth quarter. Let's just let's just coast to the champion. Oh, coast to this win. 
And Jimmy Butler did that. The Bulls um, lost to the role players of the Philadelphia 76ers. And not just lost, but got blown out, y'all. <laughs> Tony Bradley was looking like Will Chamberlain. Dwight Howard was looking like D12. Um, um, Matisse Stuy was looking like Gary Payton. Wendell Carter played like 12 minutes because he couldn't guard Tony Bradley. He couldn't guard. Listen, as much as I love these players on this Bulls team, Bulls fans, we have to come to the realization that as a core of these four to five players, we, we have to remember also we have the youngest starting five in the, in the NBA right now. But as a core, there is a defensive ceiling with this team if Kobe White, Zach Levine, Laurie Marketing, and Wendell Carter is your four. right? And that's something I always have to tell myself when I'm watching these guys play. At the end of the day, with these four, we're not going to be we, – we, can we sneak into a playoff? Sure. We're never going to be a good defensive team with those four. We just won't, right? And and people always ask me, like I've been on some some other podcasts, people say, Kenny, as a Bulls fan, who do you want to see your team keep? Who do you want to see your team deal? And I never have the answer to it. That's why I'm so happy I don't have to I don't have to make those decisions. I don't know out of our core which ones we should be building around and which ones should we like ship off to try to get something that fits better. I don't know. But this is an embarrassing loss. We've had a, we have a decent amount of embarrassing losses this year, Chicago. This was one of them, bro. This was one of them. Tony Bradley? Tony Bra Matisse Stiebel made Zach Levine look like not an all-star. You know what I'm saying? And Matisse Stiebel does that to players, so I'm not even tripping, Zach. You know, you got you got a little leeway, of course, being an all-star. Um, Matisse Stiebel's just that good defensively. Um, yeah, I don't know. Terrible. It, it, nobody told them they were playing basketball again. And all that being said, Laurie Marketing looked amazing offensively. It's just so weird. The man didn't miss a shot from three. I think it was seven for seven for three or something similar to that. And we lose by 20. <laughs> <laughs> to the team that was missing their two All-Stars. I don't understand. Um, the Timberwolves get their eighth win of the season, which is so crazy because they, like, I, I watched the majority of this game. I should have tuned out a long time uh, a long time after they got this lead because why was I still watching? It was a blowout, blowout. But I like the way they decided to guard Zion. I don't know if this is true, but I've watched an okay amount of Minnesota Timberwolves minutes this season. I don't know if Car Anthony Towns and Nas, Nas Reed have ever played on the court together until today. That was their plan against Zion. We're just going to put some big mofos out there. <laughs> and, and Nas Reed's going to take three charges tonight. You know what I'm saying? That was their defensive plan. And then they had the rookie class look amazing. Anthony Edwards ended, ended with 27. Um, who else was uh, – Jaden McDaniels had a dub and he shot a fish. I didn't know Jaden McDaniels had that type of – had that type of torch on him, four for five for three. Jalen Noel, we already talked about the stock of Jalen Noel and how I, I bid in a long time ago. He had a 28-point game today. This is a good win for them as a team, man. Could this be the one that makes them a competent NBA team? I don't know. Um, the Pelicans have some some trouble. But, you know, I'm done talking about the Pelicans as far as the negative light because at the end of the day, um, they just don't have a well-constructed team around their star player. They just don't. Um, and due time, hopefully, hopefully they decide to make the moves that that fit the players around. Like, and and this is a big off season for them because they have to fill, figure out um the Lonzo thing, or maybe they deal him before the deadline. You know what I'm saying? They have to figure out this Lonzo thing. Um, they have to figure out the Eric Bledsoe thing because Eric Bledsoe doesn't do a damn thing right now. Um, and then the Warriors lose a big game, and I say that because I didn't watch it. it. If I didn't mention the game, I didn't watch it. The Warriors lose a big game because um Steve Kerr um the disciplinary action for James Wiseman. Um, I think he played the entire fourth quarter and scored 14 in that fourth quarter. So, um, he didn't play any of the first three. Just to remind you, entire fourth quarter, team looked trash. Um, good win for the Clips though. Good win for the Clips. All right, I think I talked way too much. Let me know what you think about some of the things I said, and I'll see y'all soon. Call game.